Welcome to the complete full day, the first complete day of the International Feature Conference 2021. Welcome to Cologne. And as you know, Germans are very well known for their punctuality. So we are sorry about the very short delay. Today is about investigative research. It's about in-depth journalism. Tonight, for example, there will be a listening theater uh, about a story an asylum seeker died under very suspicious circumstances in German police custody. Before that, we will have a plenary with two investigative reporters of the Süddeutsche Zeitung. They've been uncovering Paradise Papers, Panama Papers. Um, they have been leaked the Ibiza video of Austria. And before that, I'm sure you're all looking forward to that, will be the discussion groups. You all should have been assigned by now to one of the three groups, A, B or C. We will explain the procedure, how you get from here to the discussion groups later on in this session. Sessions. Amongst others, there will be stories about uh, Corona, there will be stories about abuse in sports or a story about what do you do when your child ends up in prison. At the end of this session, we will post the links for the discussion groups, so you only have to click on them and you can stay in this session, but I will explain it later again at the end of this session. But we will start with a special. For me, as a, as a feature maker, as a fellow feature maker, it's probably one of the best forms for in-depth journalism uh, or stories. That's serial podcasts. Um, we will start with two deep dive stories. One is about one of the biggest political scandals in a country, and the other is about one of the biggest civil catastrophes. The scandal I'm talking about is the arms crisis in Ireland in 1969-1970 and the catastrophe we look at the Grenfell Tower fire in London which happened in June 2017. Although both stories happen to be in the past, they are both still unfolding and ongoing right as we speak. So I'm very happy that makers and producers took the time to join us even on a Sunday. Jasper Corbett is the editor of the Grenfell Tower Inquiry podcast from the BBC and Ronan Kelly is producer for Gunplot from RTE and I just want to check if they're both with us. Jasper and Ronan, I hope you can hear me and you will be there now. At least we see you have some listeners there already. I'm here as well, can you see me, hear me? I uh, can hear you at least, that's fine. So I know you okay, are there. That's all you need. Yeah, that's nice. So I'm assuming Jasper and Ronan are there. Um, so let's start with them talking, um, talking to him. Both of them, just for the procedure, will show us a short presentation of their podcast or talk about in a short presentation of their podcast. And then we have a Q&A with them. In total, it will be about 50 minutes. Um, use the chance. You can post any time questions you have for the both of them uh, in our chat. Johannes and Leslie, they are monitoring the chat and they will work out some questions we can discuss with them later. This presentation part, this is streamed live. The Q&A session afterwards will be a closed job um, within the delegates of the IFC, just to make sure we can talk openly about the different, uh, different podcasts and uh, series. We start with the Grenfell Tower Inquiry podcast. It's 153 episodes and still counting. Um, it won the British Podcast Award in gold, amongst others. And this podcast is not only giving people a voice, but also explaining the immense complex technical details of the fire. I guess we have a picture here just to give you an impression of how the Grenfell Tower looked when it was on fire. So you really have an impression of what's going on there. It's really some kind of yeah, gruesome. And I can only imagine how difficult it must be to extract stories out of a public inquiry. So Jesper, please. Um, st we'll start with you. Give us an input of how do you work as a Grenfell Tower podcast inquiry, inquiry podcast, sorry. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, I suppose I should start really just with, with the tower and, and, and that appalling image uh, that you can all see in front of you. I mean, Grenfell was this 24-story concrete tower uh, that was in West London. Um, it was completed in the early 1970s. And at the time of the fire, there were about 127 flats um, but the exact number of residents was not known. And it was obviously one of the most diverse communities in London. Um, people have made, made it their home from all, all over the world. Just before one o'clock on the morning of the 14th of June, 2017, a fire started in a fridge freezer in a flat on the fourth floor. This then quickly spread to the outside of the building and it took hold in all the cladding, which had just been installed as part of a nine million pound refurbishment. And that's what you can see in the picture there that, that, that's caught 
fire. Um, and the fire climbed to the top of the building in under 20 minutes, from the fourth floor to the, to the 24th, in under 20 minutes. And once it was there, it then spread around the top and back down, going back into the flats. And inside, in the communal lobbies, and there was just one single staircase through the building, um, which was obviously the only way out, uh, there was thick, dense black smoke. Um, initially, the residents who called the fire brigade were told to stay put in their flats because the building was a concrete building and it was meant to be designed to stop fire spreading from one home to another for at least an hour to allow the fire brigade enough time to reach people. Now, that obviously didn't happen uh, and 72 people died as a result of the fire. Dozens more were injured and it is without doubt one of Britain's worst peacetime disasters. So let's go on to the public inquiry. This is set up shortly after the uh, disaster and it's led by a retired <coughs> High Court judge. Um, a public inquiry in the UK is a bit different to a criminal trial. It doesn't seek to determine guilt and innocence. It really is just trying to find out what happened and why it happened. And then on that basis, it's, it makes recommendations to government to prevent anything like this hopefully happening again. So for us, as soon as the inquiry was set up, it, it was obvious it was going to be a really important one and it had the potential to uncover really, really significant systemic problems in the building industry and in the construction industry and raise really important questions about the nature of social housing in Britain and the response of the emergency services. But obviously, uh, we're quite familiar in Britain with, with public inquiries and they take an awfully long time. They go on for years and they're long and they're complex. And this means they have a tendency to drop in and out of the daily news cycle. So we decided the podcast was one way in which we could follow the inquiry every step of the way. So we work in two different ways. We make a podcast. And this reports in detail on what the inquiry is heard each week. Um, in phase one of the inquiry, which was all about what happened on the night of the fire, which ran between June and December 2018, we made a daily podcast. Uh, now we're into phase two, which is about why it happened and how it happened. Uh, we're making a weekly podcast. But one of the most important parts of that is because we have a small team of three watching the inquiry every day and when, um, when the pandemic permits actually going to the inquiry room and sitting there, um, what we try and do is we make sure that all our work feeds into wider BBC News coverage of the inquiry. So that means most days we're, we're, we're like a sort of internal news service, I suppose, for Grenfell in that sense. We are producing, you know, bits of copy. We're appearing on other bits of um, BBC outlets, radio, TV. We're writing pieces for online. And then the other bit of it beyond the podcast is that we have made um, two feature length documentaries um, looking at a particular story of two different flats um, that emerged as a result of the evidence we heard. Um, so in terms of how we make the podcast, the inquiry tends to hear evidence four days a week, and then it publishes lots of written evidence, which can be up to hundreds of pages each week. Um, but our job is really made quite difficult, not just by the huge volume of information that's published, but also because the inquiry is not really interested in storytelling in the same way that we are. Um, you know, it's, it's a really formal process. It's run by lawyers who are asking the questions, and they're focused on quite narrow legal points sometimes. And they're not interested in piecing together a complete story. So our job is to sort through it all each week and try and come up with something coherent. Um, the nature of the podcast really depends on the evidence we hear. Um, I'll play you a clip now from one of the podcasts during phase one of the inquiry. And in phase one was what happened on the night. So we heard a lot from residents and firefighters. Um, this is a clip of someone called Farhad Neda, who lived on the top floor of Grenfell. And he's talking about the moment when he decided to leave his flat and try and escape down the staircase. And you'll hear him mention Sabir, who is his father. Um, and the narrator of the podcast at this point was Eddie Mayer. Up until that point, we would keep on moving further and further back into the flat uh, until the point where we got to the kitchen, which is the last place that remained smoke-free. Um, after that, we didn't have anywhere else to hide from the smoke. Farhad Neda shouted to Sabir that they should try to get out. He agreed. 
Farhad grabbed his mother, Flora, and ran out into the lobby. At that point, Farhad Neda says he has a clear memory of seeing Saber helping the four women in their flat put wet towels on their faces so they could escape through the smoke. This was the last time he saw his father. In his witness statement, he said that to his mind, his dad was a hero. He did not put himself first to rush out with them, but instead stayed to help those in distress. Farad Neda thought his father would be right behind him. I just thought, I'm just going to take a deep breath in and hold my breath and go as far as I can. Mm. The lobby was full of thick, black smoke. It was hot. Every time I would take a breath in, I could feel my throat and my lungs burning. I, I could feel it, literally. So that's a, a clip from there. And you, could, you, you get a small sense of kind of how visceral a lot of that evidence was and how really raw and obviously, how t you know, traumatised a lot of the witnesses were. So the inquiry arranges the evidence it hears by organisations and when people are available. So it often tends, it, it jumps around a lot between topics and um, chronologically as well. Um, and so, for instance, during phase one of the inquiry, over months and months, many witnesses talked about what happened on the 14th floor of Grenfell. And it was, became clearer and clearer that something awful had happened there. Something had gone very, very badly wrong. Um, and what actually happened, it turned out, is that firefighters reached the 14th floor, they knocked on the door of each flat, and they found eight people sheltering there. Um, the firefighters who were there didn't think they could get so many residents down the stairs safely without support. So they moved all eight of the residents into one flat, and this was flat 113. And this was on the side of the building furthest from the fire at that point, so they, they thought they would be safe pay for that. Um, and they told the residents, all eight residents, they'd send firefighters back to bring them all down together safely. But crucially, in the chaos of the night, the firefighters who were sent up later were never told how many people were actually sheltering in flat 113. So the firefighters arrived, knocked on the door, opened it quickly, and they grabbed four people who were just standing at the entrance to the flat in the hallway, closed the door, and took them all down the staircase. That meant there were four people left behind, including a two-year-old boy, and they all died. So in our case, we knew we had the evidence um, from the people who escaped that flat, who had appeared at the inquiry or written witness statements, and we had the evidence we'd heard from firefighters who visited flat 113. Um, we also had the evidence of some expert witnesses who explained how the fire spread around the building. So using these witness statements, the transcripts of the raw evidence, the audio from all the programs, we knitted together this minute-by-minute -minute account of what happened. And that then became an hour-long documentary that ran on um, BBC Radio 4 and the World Service. Um, so I'm going to play you a clip from that documentary, and you'll hear in this order the presenter, Katie Rousel, um, you'll hear Oluwashen Talabi, a resident of Grenfell, who uh, was giving evidence. Peter Herrera, one of the firefighters who moved them all, one of the first firefighters who moved them all into flat 113. And Andrew Kinnear, who's a counsel for the inquiry. The four residents who had left, Rosemary Oyawale, Oluwashen Talabi and their daughter, and Omar al Ali, made their way down the tower's central staircase. It was filled with the same thick, dark smoke found in the lobby. It felt like I was being strangled. My door was behind me and she was making all sorts of noises. And it was just painful to hear. I don't know, you feel like you're putting your door through. Like, obviously, it's not your fault you're trying to save her, but that's the worst thing you, you, you can put your door through. CCTV images show that around 2.44 in the morning, the four residents from flat 113 made it to the ground floor. Rosemary and Ola Washen's daughter was carried out of the tower by firefighters so she could receive medical attention. At the bridgehead, Peter Herrera reported back to the officer who dispatched him. I told her 113 was searched, was not searched, was empty. There was no one left. We uh, did you say, the bridgehead, that it was empty because that had been confirmed by quotes the Syrian man to whom no, you No, no, it was confirmed by me. I, I, I believe that that was empty. And did you, did you confirm to the bridgehead that you hadn't carried out a final search of flat 113 before well, this, you came this down? Is, this is the whole thing. We, we weren't, 
we weren't told to go and search these flats. We were told to go and there, there are people waiting to be rescued, to be, te- to, assisted, to be assisted down. If you were in that situation behind that door waiting to be assisted down, you'd be re- ready to go. Outside the tower, Omar al Hajali realised that his brother Mohammed was no longer with him. He phoned him. Mohammed told him he was still in flat 113, alongside Dennis Murphy and Zainab and Jeremiah Dean. What you say in this paragraph was, whilst I was still on the phone to Muhammad, I walked over to a fireman inside the tower and told them that my brother was still in the flat and could not get out. I was saying, please go upstairs, please, there are children upstairs. In his written statement, Omar al Haj Ali says he tried hundreds of times to tell firefighters that his brother was still inside. He told Muhammad they were coming, but that he should leave the flat if they didn't arrive soon. So um, there you get a sense of just, I mean, it was obviously really chaotic and difficult for the firefighters, but, um, you know, there are points where clearly things didn't go, didn't go right at all. Um, And really the point of that documentary is because we had sat through the evidence day by day, we could try and piece it together, sort of like a, like a jigsaw. Um, But in the case of that one, it, it, it was easier really than the subsequent documentary because um, in October 2019, the inquiry produced this huge report, a thousand pages on what happened on the night of the fire. Um, and we took our time, read the whole thing. And in one section, uh, the presenter and producer, Kate Lamble, spotted a story which we hadn't heard about in the inquiry. And the reason we hadn't heard about it was because it was a story about a flat where no one escaped. And so... Uh, they clearly, no one, we hadn't heard any evidence at all. And it was about the five members of the same family who lived in flat 142 on the 17th floor. On the night of the fire, they made an emergency call four times over two hours, but no firefighter was ever sent to try and rescue them um, because their details got lost in the volume of calls the emergency services received on that night. So all five members of the family died. And in the evidence, um, the only reference we'd heard was emergency call handlers being asked what they'd done with the details of flat 142. Um, And it was a relatively easy process to search the testimony for any mention of this flat. You could look at the images taken of flat numbers written by firefighters on the walls of the tower, images which are all time-coded, so we could check when the information had been written down and where. And the transcripts of all the emergency calls were available, so by searching By flat number, it was possible to identify the ones made by the residents of flat 142. And although the speakers are never identified in these transcripts, you could cross-reference all of this with comments made in the inquiry and identify who in the flat was talking. Um, So that means even though all the residents died and we heard no oral testimony from them in the inquiry, we could still piece together the actions of the firefighters and the words of those residents to sell the story of what happened. And this became a second documentary, uh, and as well as an online piece. And here's a clip from it. You'll hear the name Husna mentioned several times. That's Husna Begum, who lived in flat 142 along with her parents and two brothers. At 3.09, Husna made her third call to 999. This time, both her and one of her brothers spoke. Control room operator Yvonne Adams answered. The situation in flat 142 had deteriorated. Fire Brigade. Hello, Fire Brigade. Hi, uh, my house is on fire. OK, are you in Grenfell Tower? Yeah. OK, what floor are you on? 17. 17? Can you get out? No, there's smoke coming in. Have you got fire in your flat? Yeah. The fire's in your flat? Then you need to get out, OK? Husna Begum said again that there were five people in the flat. There was now a fire in the kitchen and hallway. OK, you need to leave your flat. What you need to do... Right... You need to cover, you need to get wet towels, wet sheets. We can't get to the bathroom. You need to leave the building, you need to get out. How? I can't get to the stairs, the smoke's too thick. I think you're just going to have to go for it, just leave the building. At the end of the call, Husna tells her family they need to get into the hallway. You need to try and make a run for it. Are you still there? Are you still there? Hello? Hello? 
This time, there's no record in the LFB's log that anyone in the control room passed the details of Flat 142 to any firefighters on the ground. Still, no firefighters were sent to reach Flat 140. So um, that was that, that was taken from that documentary, and um, obviously that long silence on the on the final call was um, was what was recorded on the um, in the transcript of the emergency services. So really, just quickly to sum up, by staying with the story of the public inquiry day by day and over three years, we've achieved a couple of things. We've enabled the BBC to cover the continuing news story in a way that traditional newsrooms might struggle to do, given the resources. And we've also been able to make these in-depth documentaries um, and online pieces that would be almost impossible to do if you haven't followed the evidence day by day. Jesper, thank you so much um, for this insight of the way you're working. And uh, yeah, I think it's very powerful excerpts we just uh, listened to. Please stay with us. Um, and for you, probably you have some questions for Jesper. Don't be shy. Uh, put it into the chat. Johannes and Leslie down there, they will monitor the chat and pass some questions on to me. We will have um, a look at the time. And to be fair uh, to both productions, I would like to move on uh, at the moment to the other project we have, uh, we have in this, uh, this session. Uh, and then take your questions if we still have some time. And I hope that's okay for procedure-wise. So we move on to another story. And I guess we have a picture there as well. Some kind of a uh, typical scene, I hope. Yeah, kind of at least. So it's black and white. It's a special kind of idea. We get there. It's Thursday, 7th of March. Uh, unfortunately, there is no year because we're diving in the year 1969, 1970. And we're talking about gun plot. What I love about this podcast, this production, it's on the one hand side covering an identity building event for a nation and the story is taking me step by step through this complex web of cast and persons and revealing new aspects by the way and I personally just to comment I like the sound it has been produced it's a huge project and actually it's brand new it started April the 12th one episode each week and there is a TV documentary as well so there's some collaboration it's five episodes out three more to come uh, and it would like to integrate people's memory in the story today. So it's really unfolding as we speak. And Ronan Kelly is the producer for Gunplot. So Ronan, please, as well, it's nice of you that you take the time. Give us an insight of the way you are working, how this story works. Well, actually, you know the answer to that, Sven. <laughs> because the even though Sven says we're taking time out of the production to participate in IFC, Sven is helping the production because Sven listened to one of our programs and it featured a man in Germany who was an arms dealer who was a central part of the story, which was a story about smuggling guns into Ireland. And Sven went on to German Wikipedia and discovered that perhaps this arms dealer, who we thought had been dead, is still alive. So as we speak, we have a producer, an Irish producer who speaks German, trying to go through the phone book in Hamburg and trying to find this arms dealer. So that is a classic example of one of the huge benefits of working in a multi-program series, that you're constantly pulling in material, and you're constantly getting new information. So thank you very much for that, Sven. And hopefully we'll, we'll find this man. So the, the, about two summers ago in July 2019, uh, a TV producer, a retired TV producer approached us with some quarter inch tapes. And he was working on a PhD for, uh, for a university in Ireland about this crisis that happened in Ireland about 50 years ago. And what had happened was that in 1969, the Catholics in Northern Ireland came under attack from the local police in Northern Ireland and from the police paramilitaries. And the Catholics appealed to the people down south to protect them. And people down south protested in the streets and they said the Irish army should uh, invade the north of Ireland in order to protect the Catholics. And behind the scenes, some members of the Irish government decided they should try and send some guns up the north for the Catholics to use to fight off the attacks from the police and ultimately also to fight the British army. And this was in 1969, but officially the Irish government did not want to get involved in the armed crisis in the North, but it was discovered that some members of the government had become involved and were trying to spend some government money on sending illegal arms up to Northern Ireland, 
which if it was discovered would have caused a huge crisis with the, the British. And in May, this time 51 years ago, when those government ministers were found out to have been working behind the scenes, they were sacked. And it was sensational. It was a it was a government crisis. It was the kind of thing that people over a certain age in their 70s and 80s will always remember. The morning they woke up on May the 6th, 1970, when three government ministers had been fired or resigned from the Irish government. Now, most of us kind of have that kind of knowledge about the story in the way that uh, Jasper talked about long running stories and long running tribunals, that it was something important and something interesting in our history. So when this man came to us, he said, I have these quarter inch tapes and they're from the trial because the government ministers were sent to court and Irish courts are not televised. So the idea that we would have recordings, official recordings from a trial was sensational in itself. The fact that those recordings were 50 years okay. old was really, really interesting because it would bring us into the, the courts from, from back then. And uh, we're, uh, so he had these tapes. So we went down to the courts and we said, do we have permission to play these tapes on the radio? And amazingly, because the courts are quite private, the court said, yes, you do have permission to play these tapes. So that was July 2019. We knew we had a slot available in the October 2019 that we needed to fill and we thought we would make a one-off program because at, in those days the documentary on one and rte was all about one-off 40-minute documentaries we thought we would make a one-off program about the um cr the trial itself just using the tapes but the more we thought about the bigger story itself and what it meant about ireland and the kind of very very colorful characters involved we thought maybe we could do more and at that time Liam O'Brien, who's our serious producer, and other members of the team were working on a podcast about an Irish man who had murdered people in London by pushing them all under the underground train, which ended up being very successful. They thought, hmm, maybe we can actually make a podcast out of this arms trial. So we started doing research on it. And as I say, the starting point was the recordings of the tapes from the court. So I have a little piece of tape for you to have a listen to here. And just to explain who's sitting in the dock, the government ministers used an Irish army officer to go and try and source guns in Germany, actually, to sneak into Ireland and to sneak across the border to give to Catholics to fire on the police if they felt their area was being attacked. And this Irish army officer, when the whole thing blew up, various members of the government turned against him and said it was nothing to do with us. It was a, a solo run. He was doing it all by himself. His name is Captain Kelly. So in this piece of tape, you hear Captain Kelly answering. Now, he answers in a very staccato way. It's not the way he normally speaks. And he, you'll hear him being uh, cross-examined by the solicitor or the barrister for the prosecution, the lawyer for the prosecution. So if you want to have a listen to this piece of tape, it's from the trial. You went out with Mr. Likes again on the morning of the 17th. On April the 17th, 1970, it was time for Captain Kelly to fly off to Europe again, this time to Vienna, to meet again with arms dealer Otto Schluter. The Friday morning, the 17th. Yeah, seven, 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 yeah. yes. Captain Kelly insisted now that he be shown some of the consignment to be flown to Ireland. Tell me, when you saw them in that warehouse, you opened them and you examined them? I had one of the boxes opened. Yeah. Were you... Um, having a sort of a controversial conversation with her slighter as Mr. Likes mentions in his statement. When I saw the type of arms that were there I had some conversation with her slighter. Why what type of arms were they? Grossly there were, there, were ones. there were pistols. Yes. Would it be a correct description of it to say that yourself and Mr. Slighter appear to be in very bad humour? Well actually there was an element of this because uh, when I said to her, Slater, you better show me this stuff, he said, do you not believe me or words that affect him? I said, must see it. Mm. So I went down to inspect the goods. Yeah. And then when I saw them, my personal feeling was that they were not the most suitable type of weapon. Did you regard them as being of inferior material? The weapons in themselves were quite good <coughs> and quite excellent, but the type but overall, were you satisfied or would you have been satisfied to take them as a consignment? Well, they were there. We would have taken them at that stage, I think. 
So yeah. all that remained to be done was to bring the arms and yourself and Mr. Likes back, as that, you had arranged. That, that would be it. So that was the Captain Kelly, who was the army officer. That was him being interrogated or being cross-examined. And for an Irish audience listening to that, the lawyer has an extremely posh accent and the kind of accent you wouldn't hear now, a very pompous sort of a delivery. And so then we decided to go ahead and integrate those pieces of tape. And when those pieces of tape were actually stitched into the story, they really pop, they really sing, because the references in those pieces of tape like to... Her Schleuter, for example, this is the arms dealer in Hamburg. It turns out he was um, the subject. He was used in a book by the British novelist uh, Frederick Forsyth, the day and it was the guy who wrote the Day of the Jackal. So we explained who he was. His mother had been blown up because he was involved in selling arms to Algerian forces in the 1950s. So he's a very interesting, fascinating character. So when his name then pops up as Herr Schleuter in the middle of that, it, it really works for the audience. The um, other difficulties we had, obviously, are that most of the people are dead. But not only that, a lot of them, after the arms crisis, they never talked to their families about it. They never talked, and very few of them actually talked publicly, publicly about what went on. So uh, we ended up talking to their families who had very little knowledge of what went on, but had an awareness as children that something wrong was happening in their homes. So some of the most powerful stuff we got was not necessarily related to the, power, the arms crisis, but was stories of people who are now in their 50s and 60s as children in, the, in their homes when the police came in to arrest their parents, their fathers. And even though, as I say, it doesn't advance the story historically, they're incredibly strong moments. They really bring you into the time, you know, through the eyes of a child. And similarly, we were able to tell some of the stories from Northern Ireland, again, through the eyes of children, people who are now in their 50s, describing what it was like for their homes to be burnt by Protestant mobs or to be attacked by the police or whatever. Now, uh, the other thing is, because so much of the, the information that was written is text based, we ended up having to recreate situations. And we there's two of us working on the program, mainly myself and a woman named Nicolene Greer, and we co-narrate it. There's a couple of reasons for that. One is because for long passages, um, we, we want to keep the energy up, so it helps to have two different voices. The other reason is because so many of the characters are men. We have very, very few women, and actually so many of the historians are men. It's quite hard to find female historians who uh, cover this period, who are interested you know, in guns and strife in Northern Ireland. It's an area that's mainly... Of, the, of interest to male historians. So th one of the values of having Nicolene, as well as being a brilliant producer, is that it's a female voice. It gives us a, it gives us a change of energy, a change of texture in the, in the program. Um, so what we have here, the, the next piece I'm going to play you is an example of us taking a piece of text from a book, which is a story about an IRA man who was getting guns in the Republic of Ireland, smuggling them across the border, and a policeman actually helping them because at that time everybody was watching on tv the catholics being attacked and even the police who within about six months changed their minds but even the police were helping them so this is a piece uh, about guns being smuggled and it's narrated by myself and by nicolene greer and it's guns we weren't looking for bandages or for blankets or whatever this is Belfast IRA man, John Kelly. We were looking for arms, we were looking for the means of defence. And there was a trickle of guns going over the border from Irish civilians. Farmers sent shotguns, hunters sent rifles, old arms dumps from previous wars were opened up. And to all of this, the authorities seemed to turn a blind eye or even helped. For example, one IRA man, Joe Cahill, recalled that he was returning back over the border with some old guns that they had got down south. But as they approached the border post, among the officials up ahead, he recognised a Garda detective. And the detective recognised him. The detective walked towards the IRA man's car. The IRA man had a machine gun in his hands. It was a Thompson submachine gun. The kind of gun you see in old gangster movies from the 1930s. As the detective came nearer the car, 
the IRA man wound down the window and raised the gun. Before the detective could say something, the IRA man spoke. He said, we have weapons. And then showing him the machine gun, he said, I will blow the head off your shoulders. To the IRA man's surprise, the detective kept coming. In his hands, he had a parcel. He handed it through the car window and said, I've come over here to give you something. The IRA man drove on. When he opened the parcel, it contained a Colt 45 gun and 50 rounds of ammunition. Okay, I've been asked to wind up. There's, um, if anybody's interested in asking me about it, there's f- f- some fascinating insights into working on a podcast, both from the point of view of production and from the point of view of where it sits within the organisation and how we manage it, managed it as a team. Yeah. So, thank you. Yeah, Ronan, thank you. Thank you so, so much.